Hi, I'm Charlene Collins Freeman. Welcome to my tutorial on painting the figure in watercolor. This video is part two of the tutorial. In part one, we looked at the reference photo, composition, color choices, and our supplies. Also in part one, I painted the background. In this tutorial, we will focus on painting the figure and his bicycle. The supplies I use for this project include Arches Cold Press Watercolor Paper, 300 pounds. It's a half sheet and measures 15 by 22 inches. The watercolor brushes I used are Black Gold 311, size 2, and size triple zero. A Princeton Heritage Series 4050 round, size 2. I also use a Tulip Fabric Angled Brush as a lifter and a Majestic Round 4250 size 10 which is a miniature brush for the smallest details. All my watercolor paints are professional grade Daniel Smith. I chose a limited palette for this painting and those colors are manganese blue hue, phthalo blue green shade, Hansa yellow light, burnt sienna, French ultramarine, quinacridone rose, indigo, and sap green. And of course, water, water container, and paper towels. The background is completely dry and I'm ready to start painting Eker and his bicycle. I always start off with the face. I figure if I don't get the face right, there's really no point in continuing with the rest of the portrait. For his light complexion, I am using Hansa Yellow Light, Quinacridone Rose, and the shadows will be Manganese Blue Hue. In general, skin tones, especially something of this light and complexion, should be fairly watery, about two parts red to one part yellow. And I only add the blue where the shadows show up. I don't over mix my colors in my palette, rather I just drag the brush through. Sure to keep it pretty watery, I can always layer up more later. Once I get a hue that I like, I paint in the entire face. That includes painting right over the whites of the eyes. If we leave the whites of the eyes as the white of the paper, they will really look stark and unnatural. Notice my puddles of paint on my palette. I have a distinct puddle of Hansa Yellow Light, a separate one of Quinacridone Rose, and in between where they've mixed a little bit together. But this allows me to dip my brush into a either more yellow side of that puddle or a little bit more rose side of that puddle so that I can keep changing the color I pick up with my brush as I paint the skin tones of his face. For areas that are really white, it's okay to leave the white of the paper. If we find that that highlight ends up just being too light, we can come in later with a light layer and dull it down. Here you see I've picked up more quinacridone rose in my brush for this area of the face. Even though this is the first wash, I'm already starting to differentiate between areas that are a little bit more rosy or a little bit more yellow or in shadow where I will add the blue. When you see my hand going off camera to the left, it's because I'm wiping out my brush on my towel. Sometimes I'm just barely touching that brush to the towel to lift out a little bit of the water in my brush. And while the skin tones are still damp, I come in with manganese blue hue and I drop in the shadow that I see right underneath his bangs. There's also a shadow on his throat being cast by his face. 
I drop in manganese blue around the eye sockets as well. This will help to make the eyes recede into the skull of the face instead of seeming to be painted on the top of a ball. I've left the white of the paper for the highlight I see next to his nose, underneath his nose, and on his cheek. And I come in with a brush that is barely damp, no paint, and soften up the edges. While I'm painting skin tones, I go ahead and start in on his hand. Hands can be a little bit intimidating because we get really caught up in all the details of what fingers look like and nails and wrinkles and knuckles. I try to stay away from that and just paint my shapes of light and dark. Both of his hands have areas of highlight and I leave that as the white of the paper. I paint in the other areas of the hands with skin tones and I add shadowy blue, which is the manganese blue, in the shadow areas. I found that when painting things that are complicated, like the hands, the face, and feet, oftentimes we need to do less work rather than more. Here I'm dropping in a touch more of very watery quinacridone rose on the fingertips. In studying the photo, I see that the top of his hand is in shadow, so I've dropped manganese blue hue into that area. And then there's a little line of shadow in between the fingers. I definitely don't want to overwork these areas as his hands are not as important to me as his face and the whole stance he's in with his bicycle. As I paint the second hand, I continue studying my reference photo. It's an easy mistake to make to think about just painting the second hand as a mirror image of the first hand, but the light is hitting this hand differently. So I really want to study my reference photo for where the highlights and the shadows are. I leave the white of the paper for the brightest highlights in his hands. I drop in a little extra quinacridone rose on the fingertips. As I paint in the skin tones, leaving the whites of the paper for the highlights, I also pick up manganese blue hue for the shadowy areas. I like to drop in the blue of the shadow while my skin tones that I've just painted are still just slightly damp. The shadow seems to diffuse much more softly and naturally into the colors. Here you see me dropping in the manganese blue hue for the shadows. It's time to let these areas dry. So in the meantime, let's work on the clothes. I've decided to give Eker a white hoodie, which means I have to clean up a little bit of the edge of the skin tones right underneath his neck as they've bled into the top part of the hoodie. I use my angled fabric brush to lift out that area. You can see that I've dipped my brush into the water and then I squeeze off the excess water in the towel on my hand, which is off camera. And then I come back and I just run it along that edge, lifting out the skin tone paint so that I can get a nice crisp white edge on the top of his hoodie. Here I've barely touched my angled brush into the manganese blue hue and I'm running it along the edge where his throat touches the hoodie and also the shadow right underneath his chin.
I drop it in there while this area is still damp. And I smooth it out with the same brush. That really has the effect of casting a shadow on his throat and projecting his face forward. I'm still using the angled fabric brush and it has just a little bit of water in it. I'm cleaning up once again the edge between the skin tone of his hand and the white of the sleeve of his hoodie. If I were painting this hoodie a dark color, I wouldn't have to clean these edges up. I could just go in and paint right over those skin tones. For this section of the video where I'm painting the clothes, I've sped it up to twice the speed at which I was actually painting. I love painting white subjects. In watercolor, we tend to let it just be the white of the paper that shows through for our white subjects. That white of the paper has a lovely glow to it that we just can't get with white watercolor paint. I don't even have white watercolor paint in my palette. I find it too opaque and I'd rather use the white of the paper whenever possible. Whenever I paint white subjects, I always do the shadows with the mixture of manganese blue hue and quinacridone rose. That way I can create shadows that are purpley in some areas, bluish in other areas, and a little bit more rose in other areas. That was one of my main reasons for choosing a white hoodie. I thought the white would stand out nicely against that pale blue sky, but the shadows in the hoodie pick up on the same colors that are in the sky and in the skin tones, tying these areas together. Again, my colors on my palette are separate. I'm not mixing them a lot on the palette. You see a separate puddle of blue, rose, and yellow. Occasionally, I'll drag the brush from one puddle to the next, and they'll mix slightly on the palette. But it's much more exciting for me to mix colors right on the paper. I create more variety that way and an unpredictability that I find really excites me. The deepest shadows that I've created on his hoodie are on the bottoms of his sleeves and below the handlebars. The higher up I go on the hoodie, the more white of the paper I let show through, as it would be struck by more light. While I wait for the hoodie to dry, I start painting in the yellow parts of the bicycle. The basic color I'm using for the bicycle is Hansa Yellow Light. And for the shadow side of different parts of the bike, I'm going to use Burnt Sienna. For the brightest highlights, again, I preserve the white of the paper or I really water down quite a bit that Hansa Yellow Light. If your paint swallows up those highlights, just pick it up with a towel like you see me doing here. Here I've added just a touch of burnt sienna to my Hansa yellow light and I touch it into the shadowy parts of the bicycle. I have Hansa yellow light mixed with burnt sienna on the shadowy sides of the bicycle and I have the white of the paper or very watered down Hansa Yellow Light for the highlights. Then I pick up straight Hansa Yellow Light, fairly thick, and I paint it in the rest of the areas. So Hansa Yellow Light is my middle tone. The burnt sienna sections, my dark tones. And the white of the paper or watered down Hansa Yellow Light are my highlights. While I let that area dry, I add in some of the shadow side of the hoodie. I go in and darken some of the darkest shadows I see.
even though I've chosen different colors for his clothes than what we have in the reference photo, I still study the reference photo to understand where the shadow shapes should go. Again, I need to let that area dry. So it becomes an exercise of letting areas dry and not overworking them, finding other areas to paint, such as this small detail of the bike. Again, I start off with Hansa Yellow Light as my middle tone, add a mixture of Hansa Yellow Light and Burnt Sienna to the left-hand side, and pick up paint on the right-hand side. That first layer on the skin tones is completely dry, so I'm going to come in now and add details. I start off with watered down quinacridone rose and add some rose to the mouth and areas of the nose, typically the tip of the nose or the plane underneath the nose. The first layer of paint, which is totally dry now, is the foundation for the face. Now I'll just build up colors and details in the areas that need it. I've slowed down the video again so you can see in real time how slowly I was working my way through these shapes. The paint is watery enough that if I make a mistake in the shape of the nostril or the shape of the mouth, I can lift it out easily with a towel. I want to avoid getting into a position where I have to scrub out details in the face because that will disturb that first layer of skin tones. We'll likely start creating very uneven skin tones and you'll find that you want to do a second or third layer to even it out and everything starts getting really dark and overworked. So I prefer to work in these watery layers. I lay down the shape of the mouth and of the nostrils and if I like it, I leave it to dry and I can come in and darken it after it's dried. If I don't like it, I can just wash it out with the tip of a damp brush or pick it up with a towel. Here I'm softening up the red triangle underneath his nose. I'm adding just a bit more color to the mouth to define it better. Notice also I've burrowed down to a smaller brush. The smaller the details, the smaller the brush we use. And here I'm mixing burnt sienna with a touch of French ultramarine blue. And I'll use this for his dark brown eyes. I really study the reference photo to try to get the right shape of the eye, especially the top lashes and the position of the iris. Remember, I've changed where his eyes are from the reference photo. I did sketches earlier in part one so that I could have the subject looking at the viewer. And I pay careful attention to these shapes. One eye is smaller than the other one because it's farther away from us as his head is tilted. The shapes of the eyes are not identical either. So we don't just want to paint one eye and then paint the other one as a mirror image. I pick up my black gold brush again because I want to paint the shape of his hair now. That shape of his hair is bigger so I can use a bigger brush and I wouldn't want to use a small or a miniature brush to paint a large shape. The darkest part of his hair shows up on the left hand side so that's where I'll start. Again I mix burnt sienna with French ultramarine blue. And this is a fairly thick mixture. 
because that side of his head that's in shadow really has pretty dark shapes. As I paint this dark shape, especially around his ear and neck, I'm very careful with the contour. I don't want to misshapen the neck or the ear by painting the hair in the wrong place. I use the tip of the brush where I want to be sure I get an accurate contour. Also where his bangs touch the skin of his forehead shows a, a jaggedy edge to it and I want to capture that too by just using the tip of my brush to create these little flicky marks for the hairline. At the top of the head I'm careful to avoid the areas where there should be a highlight. I'm painting just what I see as the dark shapes. You can see I'm trying to capture the edge of what his hair looks like where it's up against the skin. I pick up more burnt sand and put it into the petal, but I do not put more French ultramarine. His hair is now going to start turning from a dark brown to a slightly lighter brown as it works its way from the shadow side to the sunstruck side. The video is still playing in real time so you can see just how long I was taking to paint this hair. I'm really taking my time to pick up the shapes, recreate them. I add just a touch of Hansa yellow light for a few of the strands of the hair that are the most sunstruck. So here I have my darkest in and my highlights. It's time to get the middle colors in for his hair as well. For that, I just watered down the browns I used for the darkest shapes. I water them down and create a few strands going into the highlights. I add some manganese blue hue as the blue of the sky would likely be reflected in the highlights of his hair. I don't want to overdo it and make him look like he has blue hair. I really just want it to look like some reflections on the lighter side of his hair. I continue to work my way through the shapes of the hair. There are very few strands of hair that I've painted in. It's mostly big shapes of dark or light. The bigger shapes of the hair painted in, I've now picked up the smaller brush, the Princeton, to paint in a few of the strands of the hair. As I do this, I continue to pay close attention to the shape of his hair and the shape of his head. As is often the case, as I've built up my middle tones, and even darken down somewhat my highlights, I realize that my darkest shapes need to get slightly darker still. So I add a touch of indigo to my mix of burnt sienna and French ultramarine blue just to paint in the darkest strands of hair.
For now, I've taken the hair as far as I want to take it, and it's time to let that dry and go work on another area. I pick up mostly burnt sienna with just a touch of that indigo French ultramarine blue in it to darken it a little bit, and I paint in the opening in his mouth. I do take my time with this. As you can see how slowly I'm painting in the video, I want to be sure to get that dark shape correct. As I paint the opening in his mouth, I also choose to slightly raise the corners of the mouth, just enough to turn this expression on his face to one that looks like a smile is just about ready to start spreading across his face. And that's determined by the corners of the mouth, how high or low they are in relationship to the center of the mouth. Generally, when people have an expression of neutrality on their face, the corners of their mouth are slightly lower than the center of the mouth. But as we start to smile, those corners go up and surpass the, cor the center of the mouth and go up higher as the corners are getting pulled towards the cheekbones. I start to add detail to the face. I also added brush strokes right underneath his eye of quinacridone rose and burnt sienna and I soften those brush strokes. I also deepen the shadow that's below the, his bangs and around his eye sockets. For these shadows I'm using mostly manganese blue hue and quinacridone rose. Always more rose than blue. And after I put down the paint, I clean off the paint from my brush and then just use the damp brush to soften the edges. To figure out where these shadows go, I'm really studying my reference photo. I add a little bit of quinacridone rose, very watery, along the edge of his cheek. I'm studying the reference photo for subtleties. It's easy to see the highlights and the shadows, but I'm also trying to discern those middle tones. Where are they slightly lighter or slightly darker? Where does the color have a little bit more reddish cast or a more bluish cast? Keep these washes very watery. We don't want to go in too dark. You can always come in later as it dries and do another layer if you need to. After building up the shadows underneath his bangs and around his eyes, I also decide I need to build up the shadow underneath his chin. There's a little bit of reflected light underneath there, and I think it's important to capture that. I pick up very watery manganese blue hue, and it might have a touch of quinacridone rose in it. And I re-emphasize the shadow right underneath his chin. That seems a little too blue, so I add very watery quinacridone rose to that shadow shape while it's still damp. While I have that on my brush, 
I paint in the lips. I give them a second layer. It's still really watery though. I don't want to get really bright pink too fast on this. So I build it up in slow layers, making sure that I'm not going overboard with that bright color. It's time to give those areas a chance to dry. Not only because I don't want to paint next to them or overwork them when they're starting to dry, but also because it's hard to assess the exact color and value of a watercolor until it's had a chance to completely dry. I don't know if that skin tone needs to be darkened up or pushed towards yellow, pushed towards red, or pushed towards blue. I really have to give it a chance to dry before I make any of those decisions. So I go back to painting my bicycle and I've sped up this portion of the video. It's the same idea of using Hansa Yellow Light for the medium tones, mixing in a touch of burnt sienna into the Hansa Yellow Light to create the shadows, and leaving the highlights either the white of the paper or a very watered down mix of Hansa Yellow Light. I pick up my skin tone colors to paint the little patch of skin we see between his pant legs and his socks. Unfortunately, it's off camera. It's the same formula I use for the face. Quinacridone Rose, Hansa Yellow Light, and Manganese Blue Hue for the shadow areas. I let those areas dry and I go back to finishing up the bicycle. For Eker's jeans, I use French Ultramarine Blue. Again, I follow the shadow shapes I see in the reference photo. For the darker areas of the denim, I'll add Indigo. So for the most part, his pants are just French Ultramarine Blue with a touch of Indigo in the shadow areas. For the lightest areas, I let the white of the paper show through and then paint a very watery French ultramarine blue over those. Here you see me dropping in the indigo. I'm adding the indigo when the French ultramarine blue is damp. It's not wet and puddled on top of my paper. It has started to soak into the paper. But it's damp enough that when I drop in the indigo, it diffuses really softly on the edges of the shadows. While that dries, I decide I want to do some highlight lifting on his face. I use my angled brush for this. I dip it in water, tap off the excess water on my towel, and then just lift along the entire length of his cheek. I also lift out a slight reflected light highlight underneath his chin. Notice that often after I scrub back and forth a little bit, I will use my towel to lift out any paint that I've loosened up. Again, I've slowed the video back down to real time so that you can see just how slowly I'm working my way through this. I'm definitely studying the reference photo.
and in particular, I'm looking for all the lightest lights I see. Since I've turned my painting around to have easier access to his face, I've also turned my reference photo around on my laptop. This allows me to scan back and forth between the reference image and my painting looking for accuracy. Here I've picked up my miniature brush to lift out some paint. These little highlight shapes are too small for me to be able to sculpt out with my angled brush. I always feel like I'm sculpting when I'm at this point that I'm lifting out color as I find that it starts to give it a real three-dimensional form. Be sure you tap out the excess water on your towel. You don't want to touch your paper with a brush that's fully loaded with water because that will flood everywhere and you'll find that you're losing detail instead of being able to lift it out. In paint, I go in there with my towel and lift it out. That gives me the brightest highlights. Take your time with this process. It's really satisfying to do and gives you great rewards. I'll speed up the video slightly since I'm doing the same technique throughout this process. As I'm looking at both my painting and the reference photo upside down, a few other areas start to take my attention. There are a few more strands I could add to his hair. I use just burnt sienna in the lighter areas and then a mix of burnt sienna and indigo for the darker strands. I use the same burnt Santa mix to also reshape the opening in his mouth. For the lips, I use very watery skin tone of quinacridone rose enhance a yellow light. I want to soften the edges on the lower lip. The lower lip never has as hard of an edge as our upper lip. I like working with my reference photo on my computer instead of printing it out. It allows me to enlarge it. And when I'm doing this kind of work on the face, I really want to enlarge my image to understand where the shadows are and the highlights, even the smallest shapes of them. Here I re-emphasize that shadow shape on the bottom of the nose. And I go back in and repaint some of the shadow shape around the eye socket and underneath the bangs. Every time my painting dries, I decide I need to go a little bit darker with some of these shadows. But I've really found that it pays off to do watery layers and be able to control small increments of getting darker or of color shifts as opposed to going in all at once and creating really dark shadows. I add in more really watery quinacridone rose around the mouth and the cheek area. Once the biggest shapes are painted in, the biggest shapes of shadow, the biggest shapes of highlights, then we can start building up more and more details 
I'm willing to get a little bit darker in certain areas now. Still working in watery layers. I'll add just a few more shadow shapes to the hoodie. using manganese blue hue and quinacridone rose. I paint in the darkest shadows first and then with a damp brush I just soften their edges. So far I've painted mostly the lightest and middle values other than his hair and his eyes, which are quite dark. But the darkest darks I see are really the handlebars and some of the dark details on the bike. It's time to get those in there, and then I'll really be able to see if I got the rest of my mediums and lights dark enough. For these dark details, I use indigo. Once I get these darkest darks in, I sort of have anchored my values, and I'll know the lightest parts, which are the white of the paper, and the darkest parts, which are any parts of this bicycle that are pure indigo. Once those lights and darks are established, I can play with my medium tones much more accurately. As I paint these, I do leave the white of the paper for some of the boldest highlights I see in these areas. By leaving that white of the paper, it really helps me understand the structure of what I'm painting as well. Once I've painted in these black handles and the indigo has started to dry, I can come in with manganese blue hue and do a light wash over these highlight areas that I've left as the white of the paper. Although the highlights are really bright, they're not that bright. They're not truly the white of the paper. So I'll leave them for now, and then as soon as this dries, I'll come in and water them down. I check the overall size and shape of those handles and I'm happy with them. So then I come in and just water down those highlights. I'm using watery indigo with just a touch of manganese blue hue. I'll let those areas dry and come back and finish up his jeans. On the right hand side, his jeans are lighter than on the left hand side. So I pick up just straight French ultramarine blue with no indigo in it. I do keep my eye on that reference photo looking for the shapes of shadow and light. And also looking at those compression lines of the jeans wrapped around his leg. As the jeans wrap around his leg over to the right side, it gets lighter and lighter. So I'll paint it, leaving a lot of that side as the white of the paper initially. 
I continue to paint those compression marks by studying them in the photograph. Again, I pick up indigo and drop it in while the French ultramarine is still damp to create the shadow shapes. Those are mostly on the left-hand side of his leg and where his jeans meet up with his hoodie. I don't have any paint on my brush now. It's just barely damp. And I bring over the French ultramarine I painted just a few minutes ago. That creates a nice, soft, highlighted side to the jeans. I go back in with indigo and re-emphasize some of the shadow shapes of the other leg. As I let the pants dry, I turn my attention to the shoes. They're not very visible in the photograph, and I also would like to sort of have them buried and camouflaged in the grass, but I want to give them some shade. So I water down French ultramarine blue for the shadow side of these white sneakers. And I'm not too worried about creating a lot of details in these. I want to give the suggestion of the shoe, the tongue of the shoe, those Velcro straps. But it really just wants to be a suggestion, so I'm staying away from being tight or detailed and painting it in fairly loosely. I add some burnt sienna to the mix. His other shoe is even less visible. So I barely paint in the suggestion of the blue shadows. As the jeans have dried, they've lightened up quite a bit, so I decided to come in and re-emphasize some of the shadow area. This is still French ultramarine blue with indigo. I'll let those areas dry and turn my attention to the bolds and details of the bike. Again, I'm not going to be too detailed in these areas. I just want the suggestion of what's going on. I use manganese blue hue fairly watered down. I also use manganese blue hue for this detail up towards the top of his handlebars. This piece of black rubber is pretty dark, but it has a highlight side on the right hand side. So I paint manganese blue hue first over all of it. And while that's still damp, I drop in indigo. I don't paint indigo all the way to the end. On the very right hand side, I let the indigo and the manganese blue diffuse softly together. It ends up looking like a reflection on a black object. For silver objects, I do use manganese blue hue. The bottom side of these nuts and bolts, I darken up with indigo. And I use indigo for all the darkest sections of the bike. 
For the bike's tire, I will make a nice mix of indigo and burnt sienna. And at first I'll paint it in fairly watery. Half the tire, especially at the top, is pretty light compared to the tire at the bottom. So as I work my way down, I add more indigo to my mix at a thicker consistency. As I paint the area where the tire touches the grass, I paint around that green shape to make it look like blades of grass are showing up against that dark tire. And now that I have the darkest darks in from the tire, I can see that I can darken up some of the other details. I'm going to let that area dry before I do any more detailing on it. With that same indigo, I come in and paint in socks. For that back leg, it's just barely the suggestion of a sock. I blend some of that socks indigo into the shoe shadow. I noticed that some of the ultramarine blue bled into the yellow of the bicycle. So using my angled brush, I come in and lift out some of that blue from the yellow bike. And with just Hansa yellow light, fairly thick on my brush, I come in and paint over most of the yellow parts of the bike. Doing a final layer with this Hansa yellow light has the effect of brightening it all up. So with this yellow layer, I'm done with the bicycle, and I'm ready to turn my attention back to his shoe. I'm softening it up a little bit more. I softened up some of those details I painted earlier and lifted them out with the towel, and I'm ready to let that dry again as well. And now with fairly thick indigo, I'm going to come in and paint in all the darkest details I see on the bike. 
here I'm lifting out some of the color from the silver hardware, softening it with my angled brush and lifting it out with the towel. It's time to let this area dry. So once again, I flip my painting upside down, I flip my reference image upside down, and I'm coming in to paint in more of the darker details and shapes in the face. For the nostrils and the opening of the mouth, try to stay away from using blue tones. You should stick with more brownish and reddish tones. They look more alive as they tend to imply that there's a blood flow there. For his nostrils, I use quinacridone rose with burnt sienna. I'm not just painting the nostril, but I'm painting the area around the nostril as well. These are really small areas, and I want to get the shapes as accurate as I can, so I'm using my miniature brush. And I enlarge my reference photo quite a bit on my computer. I definitely want to get these shapes done correctly. It's common to make nostrils just look way too round. So don't go on automatic pilot when you're looking at these small details. Really pay attention to what you see in the reference photo. I flip the painting back right side up and take some time to really review what I've done. I compare his face and the expression which is really created by those shadows and highlights. And I compare the reference to my photo. I'm looking for areas where maybe I need to go darker, such as the base of his nose. And a small shadow shape underneath his lower lip and underneath his eyes. For these shadow shapes, I'm painting with a very watery mix of quinacridone rose and burnt sienna. If I put the paint down and it just seems too saturated, too dark, or too big, it's easy enough to pick up with my paper towel, give the paper a few minutes to dry, and then come back in and try again. We're getting towards the end of the painting, and so all of these gestures are pretty important. I would say consider every brushstroke you make important. Don't be casual thinking you can bury a casual brushstroke later. Don't let your brush touch the paper unless you have a reason to touch it in that area. Here I'm using manganese blue hue to re-emphasize some of those shadow shapes from earlier. I'm really taking my time looking between my painting and my reference photo. I decide that I need to add more shadows between his fingers. I use a watery mix again of quinacridone rose, burnt sienna, and manganese blue hue and I'm going to give just the suggestion of that shadow. And after I've given a shadow between the fingers, I come in and also add a shadow to the darkest part of the fingers. And that's the part of those fingers that are facing closest to us, not on top of the hand or underneath the hand, but facing us directly. The shadow on his pinky and the top of his hand is actually quite dark. 
So I add a touch more manganese blue hue to that area. These details seem to take the longest, but we're not constantly moving our brush across our paper. What really makes them take so long is the slow observation and then committing to where you want to darken or where you want to lighten. The paint stroke is the smallest part of the process. The longest part is actually the observation. So take your time and just look at the reference photo before you make a commitment to what you want to do on your painting. I also find that there's a bit of shadow right behind the thumb. It's a shadow on the hand that helps separate the thumb from the palm of the hand. I go through the same process with his other hand, searching for the shadows and the highlights. I'll speed the video up slightly since I'm using the same technique I did on the other hand. I'm preserving the whites of the paper for the brightest highlights. I'm adding a purpley shadow shape between the fingers. And for the section of the hand that is facing straight at the viewer, I'm adding a bit more of a darker shadow. The tops of the hands have the most highlights because the light is coming from above. give that a chance to dry and in the meantime come back and finish up the socks. Using indigo at a thick consistency I give the socks a shadow side which really rounds out the leg. The shoes that I painted are dry now and I want to camouflage them a little bit more in the grass, just like they are in the reference photo. So I use my miniature brush and sap green and paint in a few blades of grass right in front of the shoe. Although I'm just using sap green, I'm varying how thick or thin that paint is, making it lighter in areas and darker in other areas, as you would expect to see with grass. I put a few strokes in front of the other shoe, although that one's already pretty camouflaged. I also noticed that the green grass that shows through between the tire and the bicycle and between his legs is darker than the green grass around him. So I water down some sap green and give another pass of color right up against his leg. It seems to transition more smoothly from the light side of the painting to where the grass gets a little bit greener underneath his seat through the bicycle. I didn't want it to just look like there was a yellow hill and then a green shape underneath his bike and then another green hill. With that, I'm really down to the last few details. I take a moment to assess my painting and I notice that I don't really see the back of this leg. So with French ultramarine blue and a touch of indigo, I paint in the rest of his leg. In the reference photo, it's hard to see. And maybe it's not even entirely there, but it looks really awkward in my painting. 
not see a part of those denim jeans poking through on the other side of the bicycle. And now that the tire is completely dry, I want to add just the suggestion of a few of the treads on there. It gives the bike a nice bulky look to have those textured details that run along it. I don't want to get overly detailed, but I think it'll be fun to add more shadow and a couple of these details. I'm using indigo at a milky consistency for these last few impressions on the tire. With these last few brush strokes, I'm ready to say that I'm done with this portrait of Eker. My goal was to create a painting that reminded us all of freedom, childhood, discovery, and summer. Here's the finished portrait. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Thanks for joining me.